service today will begin with a hymn calling us to praise our great Savior, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Oh, he saves us, helps us, keeps us, guides us. And oh, the last line, he is with us to the end. And that is our hope that Jesus will never leave us, never forsake us. This is our hope. So we'll sing just four stanzas of our great Savior. So let's stand together and sing to Jesus, lover of our soul, friend of sinners. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul, friend, save me, oh, save me, be my Savior, make me My, what a wonderful Savior we have, and I trust that your heart is exclaiming hallelujah today as we get to gather together as God's people and bring glory to his name. Uh, let's uh, go to prayer this morning. Our Father, as we come before you today, we want to give you thanks. We thank you for this wonderful country that you've allowed us to be a part of. Lord, we thank you for those pilgrims who years ago came searching for a place where they could have religious freedom. 
Lord, we thank you for our founding fathers that, Lord, founded this country upon the principles of thy word. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the patriots and the veterans that have fought for the freedoms that we are able to have today. And uh, Lord, as we uh, celebrate uh, another year of the anniversary, the founding of this great nation, Lord, we pause to give you thanks, knowing that uh, you are in control of all things. You, you raise up nations and you bring them down. And Lord, we thank you that in our day, you have raised this nation where we have the religious freedom to meet like we are today to honor and glorify you. Lord, we praise you today. We thank you for your great grace and mercy that you bestowed upon us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I want to welcome each of you uh, for coming today. And if you're visiting with us, uh, we thank you for being with us. I met Darren this morning. He's uh, visiting with us from uh, Southern Illinois. And uh, so uh, make sure you, you go by and uh, get to meet him and uh, see some other visitors with us. If you didn't get a visitor card from one of our greeters, if you'd raise your hand so our ushers can get one to you, we'd like you to fill that out. And uh, uh, at the end of the service, we'll trade that for a gift bag that we have uh, back at the uh, Welcome Center. And uh, we encourage you to come back and join us again. Um, by way of announcement, um, I have uh, this announcement from uh, Linda Vandeschout uh, that there will be a short meeting uh, of the Ladies Encouragement Group right after the service and uh, meet right down here in the front of the church. So if you're a part of that, uh, you can meet right after the service today. I'll be praying for uh, our teenagers as uh, Pastor Aaron will uh, be leading uh, some of them uh, to... Another mission trip, uh, there was one group that went to Minneapolis and they uh, returned. We got to hear them uh, uh, last week, give their testimony about that. About that. Another group is leaving for Detroit tomorrow. Uh, what time are you all leaving? 8.30. Okay, so um, uh, teens be here uh, in a nice bright and early. I almost like going to school. It was great, great. Um, and so uh, they'll be, uh, be gone for a week. And so be praying for them as they minister in the inner city there. And then, uh, as you noticed, especially if you were one of the last ones arriving, um, the parking lot is very full because the construction people are using up a third of it. And so, um, uh, those of you that can and able, uh, particularly on Sunday mornings, um, uh, if some of us uh, can park over here at uh, the school next door, we've got the overflow parking over there. Uh, the, there's a back door that you can uh, get in, we'll have that open. And uh, so if you get here kind of late and you can't find a parking spot, uh, that's the place uh, where we do our extra parking. So uh, thank you for that. As we go through our construction this summer, um, uh, that's going to be uh, with us for uh, a few months here. All right. I think that's all the announcements that we have this morning. So let's tune our hearts into praising our God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. So let's uh, sing together our next song. Let's all stand as we sing of the great faithfulness of our great Savior. He is our great Savior. Oh, his faithfulness is great. And the more that I have followed Jesus, the more that I've come to realize if he is not faithful to his promises, then we have no hope. We cannot rely on anything else except that he is faithful to keep his promises to us. So let's declare this together. Great is the faithfulness of our God.
get to that chorus, we'll sing it a cappella once again. Pardon for sin, the peace that he gives. Psalm 54 this morning, Psalm 54. We've been reading through selected psalms in our scripture reading time on Sunday mornings, and today we've come to Psalm 54. What kind of feelings would you have if someone threatened your life, if somebody said, I am going to kill you, or if somebody said, tonight, while you sleep, I am going to kill you? What kind of feelings would that invoke in you? Fear, for sure, right? David felt those feelings. And I love the way he starts off Psalm 54 with just these two first words, save me. Because that might be the first thing we would do, is just say, God, save me. Here is Psalm 54. Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. And then David just, he is confident that his life will be preserved. He puts his trust in God. He says, I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble. That great confidence in God. And my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. And even today, after many years, God still has our back, doesn't he? We can put our trust in him. Psalm 54 fits well with our next song, Christ the Shore and Steady Anchor. He has our back. God will save us and rescue us. And the author of Hebrews takes that truth and applies it to the theme of an anchor. And I've shared the story maybe before, but uh, the guy who wrote Christ the Shore and Steady Anchor, is, uh, his name is Matt Boswell, so he also wrote Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, which is the next song we'll sing. So we are familiar with these two songs, and uh, I've actually met Matt Boswell uh, down at Southern one time. He was in the coffee shop there, and uh, some of my friends were talking to him, and so in his ministry. Uh, so I got to meet Matt, thankful for him. And so this song, uh, he was a response. Someone uh, over in the UK just wrote a blog post, uh, not necessarily a follower of Jesus per se, uh, kind of burnt out by the church. And he was looking at all the newer songs being written, kind of being popularized. And what this guy kind of burst out on a blog was, are there any songs that miserable Christians can sing? <laughs> Because so many of the songs are kind of happy, clappy, fluffy, light. And he's, are there Christians who are miserable and suffering? Are there any new songs for them to sing? And so Matt was telling me the story and he said, I saw that blog post and so I wrote this. 
Christ the shore and steady anchor from Hebrews, when we are overwhelmed and feeling like we're about to drown, he's our anchor. Whether we're tempted, going through trials, going through death, he's our anchor. Let's stand and sing Christ the shore and steady anchor. No matter what we're going through, he's our anchor. Let's sing.
Father, we thank you for the many gifts that you've given to us, to our church and our families and our church family. Lord, we pray that you'd accept this gift back to you and that we'd do it out of a heart of love and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, children, you can be dismissed to junior church at this time. We invite the rest of you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 23 as we continue walking with Jesus through the gospel of Luke. Our theme verse, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We encourage you to take your uh, Summer Life Group booklet and turn to pages 10 and 11 in there uh, so you can take your notes and the scriptures, uh, scripture is also uh, recorded in there for you. Well, the trials are done. The sentence has been pronounced and Jesus has been delivered to be crucified. And although this is the darkest day in human history, man killing the Son of God, yet we also understand that it is also the climax of all eternity. Peter, a few days later on Pentecost, gets up and preaches to this same crowd of people. And there he says in his message in Acts chapter 2, Men of Israel, hear these words. 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put him to death. So notice as we continue in our passage here in Luke how these events unfold on this Friday of the Passion Week known as Good Friday. Good because it, re, it brings about our salvation. But also a dark Friday. God himself darkening the skies as Jesus Christ is crucified. Notice first of all Jesus on the road to Calvary. And as we look at him, we, we notice several groups of people that are encountered as Jesus makes his way from where he was scourged to just outside the city where he'll be crucified. Notice verse 26 of Luke chapter 23. It, it says, now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now here the first person we see is Simon, a man that is from Cyrene. Cyrene was a city in northern Africa where today Tripoli in Libya is located. Now, some depictions of him in paintings and so forth picture him as a black man because he was from northern Africa, and that very well may have been true. We don't know if he was a Jew because there were Jews from all, that were scattered all over the world, whether he was a Jew that lived in uh, Cyrene and then uh, came uh, in for Pentecost or for the uh, uh, Passover, or whether he was a proselyte like the Ethiopian eunuch was, uh, who actually was a black man from Ethiopia. Later, Luke records that there were many Cyrenians at the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, it says, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, as Peter there was, uh, or uh, um, Luke was listing there uh, where the Jews came from on that day because Jerusalem has swollen to its largest level ever during a year is during the time of Passover. Now, we realize that as Peter preaches, many of these are saved. And so many of these from Cyrene are saved. And it is likely that Simon was one of those that was saved there on the day of Pentecost. We don't know for sure, but it's likely that he was among that group. Later on in Acts chapter 11, it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose from Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. This is Antioch of Syria. And it says, But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. It is possible that this Simon that carried the, the cross of Jesus was one of those that became one of the preachers that went up and started the church at Antioch, which then becomes the focal point of the rest of the New Testament. This is the sending church of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 13, it gives us there a list of the pastors of the church there at Antioch. And it says, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, we know him. Si uh, Simeon, who was called Niger. Lucius of Cyrene. Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And Saul, that's the Apostle Paul. So this list of pastors starts with Barnabas, ends with Saul. But in between, we have some people that we don't know too much about. Some Bible scholars think that this Simeon of Niger is the same as Simon of Cyrene. He's listed next to another man from Cyrene, uh, Lucius. And the word Niger 
is a, um, a Latin word that means dark colored and so would be a black man. That's a possibility. We don't know for sure, but I think it's interesting to see uh, how the, the, the New Testament is interwoven. Um, but Simon of Cyrene is, is mentioned in all three of the uh, synoptic gospels. Now, if he was just some ran, just a random bypasser or uh, bystander who was inscripted by the Romans to carry Jesus' cross because Christ apparently could not carry it any farther, then it wouldn't make sense that they would have even known what his name was. But apparently, he had become well known to the early church. And so he is mentioned here. Uh, Mark in his gospel says that he is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Well, how would these gospel writers know this man and who his sons were unless something significant happened in his life? And so uh, it, is, it is most likely that he became a follower of Jesus, perhaps saved on the day of Pentecost, and that he and his sons became well known among the believers, and so that's why his name is mentioned here. It's interesting, in, um, in the church of Ephesus, there was one or two men that were called Alexander. Um, in Paul's second missionary journey, Acts chapter 19, it says, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Later on, Paul writes to Timothy, who's the pastor of the church of Ephesus. And he talks about two men that have um, gone rogue, if you would. He says in 1 Timothy 1.20, of whom are... Uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they learn not to blaspheme. Now, we don't know if that, is, that Alexander is the same one that got dragged out in uh, Acts chapter 19. And we don't know if it's the same one that is the son of Simon the Cyrene. But it could be. But you and I know the experience of there can be several people by the same first name in a church. How many of you know of somebody else in this church that has the same first name as you? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few. I, I, I'm raising my hand. Paul Peterson and I both have the name Paul. So, so, yeah, so it's very common. So it's hard to be definitive that these are the same guys, but it's a possibility because they apparently were well known to the early church. And Rufus, the other one, Paul mentions him in the church at Rome when he writes in Romans 16, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. So we don't know for sure if any of these are the same Simon or Alexander or Rufus that were mentioned here in the Gospels. But the point that Luke wants us to see about mentioning him is it says there at the end of the verse that um, that Simon bears it, talking about the cross, after Jesus. Luke's purpose is, in mentioning him is that he symbolizes and apparently actually becomes what Jesus described as a true follower of Jesus. Now, earlier in Luke, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus Christ said this familiar to us and it makes sense to us. But it must have seemed very strange when he first said it to his disciples, when he said it in Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now we know the spiritual meaning of that, but think how that had to impact the disciples. When Christ mentions taking up your cross and the visual picture, the reality that that was to them. But now Jesus kind of pulls this together and as Simon of Cyrene now follows Jesus literally with the cross 
And I believe apparently he did spiritually follow the Lord and take up his cross and follow him. The next group we see in verse 27 is, is a great multitude of people. It says there, and a great multitude of the people followed him. Who are these people? Well, they're that fickle crowd we talked about last week. Five days earlier, they had shouted, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And then earlier on this day, that same crowd cries, crucify him, crucify him, stirred to do so by the re religious leaders of that day. And now it says that they follow him. Probably to see how it all is going to turn out. The next time that we speak from Luke, we'll notice in verse 48, if you look down at that, it says, and the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. What a fickle crowd. Yes, we're for him. No, we're against him. Let's look what happens. And I think it struck them that their words, crucify him, has brought this innocent man to his death. And so I believe it was that same crowd who Peter was preaching to 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. And at the end of Peter's sermon, he says this in Acts chapter 2, therefore let all the house of Israel know, he's talking to the crowd, let them know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And verse 41 says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Aren't you glad that fickleness isn't an eternal terminal illness? <laughs> but God can take a fickle crowd that praise his son one day and crucify him a few days later. He can touch their heart in conviction and bring to them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ of why he was crucified in the first place. The next crowd that we see, or the next people we see at, at the end of verse 27 says, and women who also mourned and lamented him. This is probably not talking about uh, the followers of Jesus, Mary and Salome and uh, Chloe and the other ones. We'll see them later on in the text, uh, not today's text. But these are probably those that we've seen other places in scriptures that uh, we might think of as sort of like professional mourners, women of the community that took it upon themselves whenever there was a death in the community. They went there and lamented and mourned uh, with the family. And so you can imagine how they would feel, no matter what their crime may have been, may have been they feel for the person that is being executed and so they follow crying and weeping and mourning over them and and many people have that that compassionate heart for those that are suffering years ago when we were in South Carolina my wife and I had the privilege of taking our high school senior class on their senior trips and we would go to Washington DC each year and we would always go to the memorials at night. They're just cooler at night because they're all lit up and, and whatever. just kind of gives a, a more special feel to the memorials. And so one of the nights we, um, we would go, well, we'd usually take in two or three. One, one of the nights we took in the uh, Vietnam Memorial. If you've never been there, have never seen it, it is a, um, a granite wall. Um, it starts out very narrow and then goes down into kind of a, a, a hollow, 
hollow place. And so it starts out, you know, just a couple inches, and then the, the middle stones of it are probably eight, ten feet high. And on those, the whole memorial is just etched in those granite stones, the names of the 58,000 men and women that died during the Vietnam conflict. It's a very uh, somber place. I, I know it, it, whenever we take our teenagers there, we're going at night, and they're, they're excited because they're on their senior trip, and they're walking up to it, and they're kind of giggling, laughing, whatever. And then when they get there, they, they, the impression that that makes on you to see all of those names etched and realize that they died during the Vietnam conflict. And I remember one one time that we went there, um, my wife Debbie, she, she walks up to one of the stones and just part, puts her finger back and forth on one of the names. And then she, she begins to weep. And somebody comes alongside her and put their arm on her shoulder and said, Oh, I'm sorry. Was that your father? And she said, no. But it's probably somebody's father. She showed that compassion. She didn't know that name, didn't know that person. Many of you have that kind of heart. These women had that kind of heart for anybody that was suffering, particularly those that were going to suffer such a cruel death, that they went mourning and weeping. And what we see here is that Jesus turns and addresses them. Notice verse 28, it says, But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts who never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the greenwood, what will be done in the dry? The phrase daughters of Jerusalem is used several times in the Old Testament to represent the whole country of, Na uh, of, of Israel, the, the daughters of the capital city represent the whole nation here. And what Jesus is doing is he's describing a time of judgment that is going to come. Even now as at his crucifixion, Luke portrays Jesus not so much as the judged one, but as the one that is judging and that is in control of what's taking place. Jesus is suggesting here that the nation is, is headed to difficult times. And we see that that was fulfilled literally to that generation in A.D. 70 when the emperor Titus came and leveled the city of Jerusalem. But it also looks forward to the time of tribulation, that seven-year times when God vents his wrath upon those that have rejected his son, Jesus. And so Jesus is describing this to the women and what would make the biggest impact on them. He said, he's saying basically that during those times, it's going to be so bad that women are going to rather wish that they were barren than to go through that. And for a Jewish woman, the worst reproach you could have would to be barren. And it said, they're going to say, blessed is the barren woman. Jesus then quotes from the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 8, and he says, it says there, also the high places of Avon and the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. So Jesus directly quotes from the Old Testament. And then we see that this is actually fulfilled in the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 6, after God's wrath 
uh, of uh, the seven seals has been uh, poured out upon the earth. It says in Revelation 6, 15, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? And then Jesus uses a, um, a common idiom that uh, you find in other places in history, going back all the way, uh, uh, I read uh, one historian said that the first time they saw this was back in like 400 B.C.s. This phrase where Jesus talks about the green wood and the dry wood. Of course, the illustration is uh, dry wood burns up a whole lot hotter and faster than green wood does. So what is Christ trying to say through this? Well, the most likely interpretation is if God has not spared his innocent son from such tribulation as being crucified, how much worse will it be for a sinful nation when God unleashes his righteous wrath upon it by allowing the Romans to destroy the city and by that which would come later on in the tribulation? The next people that we see in our passage in, is in verse 32. It says there, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. This is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 12, where it says, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Some believe that they, these two thieves and robbers, as they're called elsewhere, they may have been followers of Barabbas and probably were going to be executed together and Barabbas is released and Jesus is, is put there instead. But what we do know, and we'll see this next time, is that one of them is going to become a follower of Jesus. The next verses show us Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Here we have a the description of the crucifixion. Notice if you would, beginning in verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. <clears throat> but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine. <coughs> Excuse me. And saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. We see that Christ was brought to a place called Calvary. This is just north and outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Here it's called Calvary. That comes from the Latin word, Calvariae. The Greek word is cranion, where we get our word cranium. The Aramaic or Hebrew word is Golgotha, that we see recorded in other Gospels. All of them mean the same thing. It's the word that means skull. And probably why this place was called the skull, it probably looked like a skull. Uh, Gordon's Calvary uh, has found a hill outside of Jerusalem where uh, there's indentations that sort of like, look like the uh, eye sockets of a skull, and I believe that may be the spot. But what is amazing as you look at this passage is what it says in the description of the crucifixion. It merely says, there they crucified him. 
Luke and all of the other gospel writers don't go into details of what the crucifixion actually was, how it took place, because it wasn't needed to be mentioned to anybody that was under the Roman Empire. It would be like us today if we say the phrase, he was sent to the electric chair. We don't have to go into details how someone is strapped into a chair and, and uh, uh, electrodes are, are bound to their wrist and around their head and all. You know, we don't have to go into that detail. We have seen depictions of that. We know what that means when someone was sent to the electric chair. Well, any of Luke's readers would have known all that is encompassed in they crucified him. And so, instead of focusing on the agony of the crucifixion. Let's focus upon Jesus for a moment and see what's going on with him. Notice verse 34, that as he is being crucified on a cross, he begs for forgiveness for those that are doing such. As you harmonize the four Gospels, you realize that there are seven sayings that Jesus made from the cross Luke records three of them. The first three of Jesus' statements from the cross all concern other people. John records his concern for his mother, probably because John was the one put in charge of taking care of Mary. Here Luke records Jesus' concern for his enemies. And in next week's passage, we'll see his concern for one of his newest converts, the man on the right. Jesus practiced what he preached. In his first sermon that we have recorded, his Sermon on the Mount, he there preached to us, his disciples and to us as well, how that we need to love our neighbors and love our enemies. Forgive our enemies. Forgive those that have trespassed against us. And so when you think of it, who has ever been wronged more than God's chosen son? Yet he forgave his enemies. The love of one's enemies that we are called to do is going to just pale in comparison to the love that Jesus Christ showed to those that tried him and crucified him on the cross. The early church got this message as well. You find out early on in, in the book of Acts when the deacons have been chosen and, and one of the deacons, Stephen, stands up and preaches a gospel message to the same Sanhedrin that had condemned Jesus to die. And now they condemn Stephen to die. And what is his response as they're stoning him to death? Acts 7 says, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or died. The early church got it. We as Christians are to love our enemies. We're to forgive our enemies and not take revenge upon them. We see in the next phrase, it says that they, talking about the Roman soldiers given the job of the crucifixion, they divided his garments and cast lots. My, how the events that took place around the crucifixion show us the inspiration of the Bible. For a thousand years earlier, it was recorded in Psalm 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. What an exact detail 
given a thousand years before it happened. And then notice it says that the people stood looking on. Now they are just a graphic picture of a dazed multitude. As they see what they have caused, maybe this is the first actual crucifixion that, that many of them have actually seen in person. And it's getting to them. But not to the leaders. It says that the leaders sneered. It means they turned their nose up to. And the soldiers mocked. And yet, this in itself was a fulfillment of thousand old prophecy. Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8 says, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. You would almost think that those religious leaders, as they're saying these words, had I heard that somewhere before? In the synagogue? As they read the scriptures, they shout out, he saved others. <laughs> they meant it to be a mock. But my, what a stunning admission because this is true. He had saved others. And as we've walked through Luke, we've seen him. And in the other gospels, uh, the, the woman taken in adultery, the woman at the well, Blind Bartimaeus, Zacchaeus up in the tree, come on down and receive the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. Yes, he did save others. But these don't understand that for him to not only physically but spiritually save others, he must die. He can't save himself. He has to die on our behalf. We see that the soldiers offer him sour wine or vinegar wine. This was the ordinary cheap wine that was drunk by the soldiers. And whether they do this as an act of kindness that, for someone that's in such agony, or they do it in mockery just to make him live a little bit longer so he has to suffer longer, we don't know their exact motives. But we see that Pilate has an inscription written, which was customary to identify the person, where he is from, and, and what the accusation of why he was crucified. Luke tells us that the inscription said, this is the king of the Jews. As you combine the harmony of all the Gospels, you, the full saying was, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, identifying the person, the place, and the accusation. It says that this full title appeared in Latin for the law, in Aramaic for the Jews, and in Greek for everyone. And I what a picture of what Jesus Christ is accomplishing. For by the law, he has fulfilled the law and satisfied the demands of God. <laughs> he truly is the king of the Jews, though they don't know it. And he has become the savior of the whole world and offers that salvation that whosoever will may come. So I admonish you today. Do you know him who died for sinners? Do you love him who loved his enemies while dying on that cross? And will you share him who truly was the King of the Jews, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords? Let's stand together for prayer. Our Father, as we have come together to worship today, we've opened your holy book and looked into the scriptures and today we have once again looked at the climax of your eternal plan of salvation. 
the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, your precious Son. And Lord, though our hearts sorrow, it also rejoices, for in his death we have life. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to be mindful of what Christ has done for us as we go about our week, go about our days. May we always be remembering what Christ has done for us. And Lord, may we share him, share the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again for our justification. And Lord, we pray that for the one that may be here today that has never received Christ, never did what those there at Pentecost cried out, what must we do? And Peter said, just simply repent and receive the word. And when they received it, they were added to the church. Oh, Lord, I pray that there's one here that has never received Christ as their Savior. Lord, may today be their day of salvation. May they come and receive Christ today. Lord, thank you for your great love to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Pastor Aaron's going to come and lead us into the song, Jesus Paid It All. <laughs> That's the story of the crucifixion. Every single one of your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world were laid upon Jesus, and he willingly suffered and died for us so that every single one of our sins, past, present, and future, is paid for by the blood of Christ. Let's sing of that today. Uh, today. We trust the Lord will bless you this afternoon. We invite you back six o'clock. We'll have our evening service tonight, continuing our study on the life of Abraham. Tonight we see Abraham's vision given to him by God in uh, Genesis chapter 15. So come back and join us for that. Hope you have a wonderful 4th of July tomorrow. Enjoy family and friends and the freedom uh, that God has allowed us through this great country uh, that we are able to be a part of. And uh, we trust that God will continue to bless us as a country. Jim Kessner is going to come and close us in prayer. May we go forth rejoicing that we've been in the house of God together today. All right, let us uh, pray. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for... Uh, gathering us here this morning, and uh, uh, we pray for those that weren't able to be here or, at, uh, or perhaps at other locations. We, we just thank you, Lord, for um, bringing us here, the, here this morning. Uh, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, our vets, and those who sacrificed all for freedom. Um, we pray for those uh, teens that are... Uh, going on the mission trip to Detroit. Lord, we pray that uh, you would watch over them and keep them safe, and uh, uh, may they accomplish those things that you desire for them to accomplish. Um, we thank you, Lord, for the message today that reminded us of the great sacrifice that uh, Jesus paid on the cross for each one of us, Lord, um, and invites us to uh, receive him and uh, and come to him in salvation. And then, Lord, we, uh, as we close, we pray for opportunities that we have, Lord, to, uh, to reach others. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, not only would we uh, receive those opportunities, but we would act on those opportunities uh, with boldness to bring others to Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name.